As newborn babes desire the rational milk without guile. Words taken from our intro. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, we shall consider first the basic dangers that are posed to our faith, and second, how we can nourish and exercise our faith daily. The Catechism tells us that faith is the virtue by which we firmly believe all the truths God has revealed on the word of God revealing them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Faith is a gift, a grace infused into the soul of the Christian. It is impossible to be saved without faith, but God always gives the means necessary to accomplish his commands, so this gift is given to all, or made available to all who receive it at least. It is a gift too, which once given lives in the soul, and thus it can be nourished and strengthened, or we can let it wither and die. It's like a seedling of some wonderful rare plant that we discover in our garden. Now we see constant examples around us of how it can be so starved. People lose their faith, that little seedling, by not learning it well to begin with. How many children have had faith infused into their souls by baptism and are then starved by public or even parochial schools? Adults, too. If you do not learn well the doctrines of the church, or at least as well as you learn the other things you know in your life, then you are not likely to have a strong faith and will be open to all sorts of challenges and temptations. Similarly, neglecting the practice of religion. Now, true, it is only sinful if you violate the laws of the church, but you can still endanger your faith by not feeding it sufficiently. So it's not sinful to omit the daily rosary. But if you say no daily prayers at all in your family, how will you feed that seedling of faith so that it can withstand the dangers of the world that we live in? It's not as if we don't live in a very dangerous world, which brings us to other dangers to the faith. Needlessly exposing oneself to things opposed to the faith, like TVs and movie, TV and movies, even if it doesn't have bad language or bad images in it, um, a TV show that contradicts the faith on some essential point, like that encourages one to find his own truth, or that all religions are salvific, it's good as long as you're a good person, can have a very damaging effect on your faith, especially if it is not that well informed or strengthened. And that's why we really want to protect our children from these things. Similarly, Exposing ourselves unnecessarily to people who are opposed to their faith or whose lives are unashamedly opposed to the faith. We must accept, you know, venial sins and, and people who are sincerely repentant. But those who are, have set themselves against the faith will be bad influences on us. We have to ask ourselves, how long will your faith last if you surround that tiny little plant with lots of weeds? They'll choke it out. You wouldn't let your favorite seedling be surrounded by weeds in your garden. Have as much care, then, for your children and your own soul. From this, too, it is clear that it would not merely endanger your faith. It would be a direct sin against it and give scandal to your neighbor to participate in any non-Catholic worship. People think, oh, that's the church is chained on that. Nope. No, because that's a moral law. Moral laws don't change. You can't participate in false worship because it's false. It's a lie. Finally, doubt. Actively doubting. Willingly choosing to hold as undecided or in question some article of the faith is to sin gravely against the faith. But doubting in less serious matters is also sinful. So how should we handle those little doubts that may plague us from time to time? St. Francis de Sales gives this excellent advice. He says, The temptations against faith go directly to the understanding to draw it to argue and to get caught up in all these things. When a temptation against the faith starts raising questions in your mind, such as, How can this be? 
But what if this? What if that? Instead of debating the enemy with arguments, let your effective side attack him with full force. And even let your thoughts be reinforced by your voice crying out, You traitor! You wretch! You left the church of the angels, and you are trying to get me to leave that of the saints. Disloyal, unfaithful, perfidious one, you gave the apple of perdition to the first woman, and now you want me to bite it too. Get behind me, Satan, it is written. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. No, I will not argue with you. When Eve tried to dispute with you, she was lost. She argued and was seduced. Live Jesus, in whom I believe. Live the church to which I cling. Thus far, St. Francis. Now to the second part. How do, I, how do we strengthen our faith and live it daily? We must believe with great simplicity of heart and soul. In a word, we must become like little infants. We must, must nourish our faith, not so much with proficiency in technical arguments, but with a spirit of calmness and security and simplicity. For faith is not a virtue that you gain once, like a degree, and then put away into storage. Neither is it simply a virtue confined to our affirmation of basic dogma. Faith should be a virtue that pervades every single thing we do, in particular. It should guide how we respond to the misfortunes of life. For it can easily happen that we may affirm intellectually that God is all-powerful and all-loving. That's easy. But we may invite doubts or even succumb to them when it seems that he has abandoned us to disaster, suffering, and failure. Consider what we have all seen so recently in our Lord's Passion. Consider the faith of our Blessed Mother Mary in contrast to that of all the other of Christ's disciples. Our Lord Jesus Christ foretold his death and resurrection, not once but many times. And this was clearly heard. Remember how much Peter objects to it when he hears this. What is more, Christ proved the truth of everything, everything he said through his miracles and his heavenly teaching. Where was the faith of the apostles then? Why did they not believe him? If anything, you would think that they would have believed him all the more when his predictions about his death started to come true. Hey, you know, this is exactly what he said would happen. Gosh, he's been right all along. Maybe he's right about the resurrection too. But we must remember the blinding effects of fear and pain and trauma. When we undergo these things, they loom so large in our imagination and in our own memories that it's often hard to see outside of it. It's hard to imagine something else. It's hard to remember time before this happened, time before that happened, time when it wasn't like this. It's one thing to believe in the resurrection when times are good. It's another when the reality of suffering is filling everything you see. It's one thing to believe, in theory, in the infallibility and the indefectibility of the church, especially when we're standing, looking back, that great 2,000 years of tradition, that same teaching, year in and year out, and all confirmed by all the miracles of all those saints. But it's another to hold on to this belief firmly in our daily lives and in our hearts when it seems sometimes we see nothing but disaster and destruction. We must ask, though, is God only in charge when things are going well? Does misfortune disprove providence? Turn away from evil. Turn your eyes from evils that you cannot remedy. Turn your mind from meditating on what is wrong and turn your soul towards God. 
Turn as an infant does to its mother. Be like little infants. Do they worry where their food comes from? Do they have to know how their mother's body works? Does she even have to know this? No. Now, following Augustine, you may say, Oh, infants are not always so faith-filled. Why else do they cry? Why indeed? Self-will. The fear of not being in control. When infants wish to eat, most often they are fed close to the time they wish it. But when they are not, when their helplessness confronts them, when their commands are ignored, then they know they are powerless and terrified. There's no more illusion of control, like a car on ice, which is a metaphor that you guys will understand where people in Louisiana, not, not so much. You're driving along and you think you're in control of this car until you hit the ice. Then you realize you're just coasting along in a big box and it's not listening to you. Faith in your own power will always be false and eventually proven so. The more faith you have in yourself and your power, the ruder will be the awakening, and the more sad or angry or both you will become. Consider this. If you are sad or angry that you aren't in control, then you shall be sad and angry all the way to eternity. Faith, however, trusts in the power of God. As we know in our minds that God is absolute, that God's power is absolute power, so must we believe in our hearts, in our words, in all of our actions, in every fiber of our being, in everything we say and think and do. In short, we must cultivate a faith like that of our Blessed Mother Mary, who alone, alone among those in the whole world, never doubted Christ, who always knew that he would, in fact, rise just like he said he would. Now, it's easy to imagine what others might have said and very likely did say to our Blessed Mother all along the way, which we might say to ourselves or have said to us with regard to the state of the Church. Did not, would not people have asked our Blessed Mother, aren't you worried that Jesus' enemies are gaining power? Aren't you worried that he's been taken captive by unjust stewards in charge of God's chosen people? Aren't you worried now that they've delivered him over to Caesar? They've given him to the pagans. Okay, now that he's been scourged and sentenced to death, now that they're nailing him to a cross, wouldn't you say now is a good time to panic? now that he has breathed his last. But Mary never doubts, and neither should we. This is all according to plan. Even if I don't know what that plan is, I don't need to. Once again, St. Francis de Sales helps us with this image. He writes, The daughter of an excellent physician and surgeon being in a continual fever and knowing that her father loved her entirely, said to one of her friends, I feel very great pain, but I do not think of remedies, for I do not know what might serve my cure. I might desire one thing and another be necessary for me. Do I not then gain more by leaving this care to my father, who knows who can do? who wills for me all that is required for my health. I should do wrong by willing anything, for he wills all that could be profitable to me. I will only wait to let him will to do what is expedient. And when he comes to me, I will only look at him, testify my filial love for him, and show my perfect confidence and on these words she fell asleep. Meanwhile, her father, judging that it was fit to bleed her, disposed all that was necessary, and waking her up, 
asked her if she were willing to suffer the operation. My father, she said, I am yours. I know not what to will for my cure. It is yours to will and to do for me what seems good to you. It is enough for me to love and honor you with all my heart as I do. So her arm is tied, and her father himself opens the vein. And while the blood flows, this loving daughter looks not at her arm, nor at the spurting blood, but keeping her eyes fixed on her father's face, she says only from time to time, My father loves me, and I, I am entirely his. And when all was done, she did not thank him, but only repeated her words of filial confidence and love. Thus far, St. Francis. See how sincere faith comes from charity and returns to charity. To falter in our faith in God is to falter in our love for him. Let us pray daily for a faith like Mary's. Let us make continual acts of faith, not simply explicit statements, but let us look at everything through the eyes of faith. Do all things with charity, nothing without charity, and see all things with the eyes of faith. Be not unbelieving, but believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.